Okay, so now it's less time. Less, uh, it's time to enter the most interesting part uh, of, of the language, uh, which is how it handles with functions. No? And functions are again a bit strange, but they are one of the most uh, say distinctive elements uh, in, in JavaScript and. Uh, the way we are using functions uh, shapes uh, a lot of the way we are writing code in JavaScript. So the interaction between arrays, objects, and functions creates, uh, let's say, a lot of programming patterns uh, that are uh, unique to this language. Mm -hmm. um, basically, or we already know what a function is. It's a block of code uh, with a list of parameters and a return value. And this is nothing new. Uh, from the point of view of the, of the language, uh, apart from the syntax that you use to define the function, uh, once the function is defined, is a is an object like all the other objects, and this means that uh, the name of the function doesn't have a special meaning. It's just the name of a reference that will point to a value that will contain the real function. And that's why functions can be assigned to variables, can be passed as arguments to other functions, can be used as return values from other functions, can be put into object properties, can be put into array elements, and so on, like any other value. So we have a special syntax for defining a function, of course, because we have to write the body of the function itself. But once it's defined, uh, it's just a value that we can manage how we prefer, okay? And so there will be a lot of uh, passing around functions. But let's start from the beginning. Uh, there are three different ways uh, of defining a function, three different syntaxes for defining a function in, uh, in JavaScript. The classical way, function is a keyword, then the function name a list of parameters. Of course, no type declarations for the parameters, no type declaration for the function itself. So we just use the function keyword and the list of parameters, one after the other. Okay? And uh, a body of the function itself uh, in, in uh, braces, hmm? in curly brace. That's the normal way. We create uh, a new identifier do that will refer to the function itself okay so in this example where i capture some screenshots from the javascript tutor we see a function called uh, square that inside uh, receives one parameter called x and inside it defines a local variable y that of course is computed as the square of x time itself uh, and returns this final value y. And in the line after that, we are calling this function. Nothing special, okay? Uh, the interesting part is uh, this corner of the picture where square becomes a normal variable that holds a value in the object space. Okay? Um, like n is a variable that here takes the value 16. So n and square are the same. They are both variables. Okay, here they are in the global scope because we are outside of any other function, but it's just a detail. Okay, so it means that this Whenever I use the identifier square without the parentheses, I'm referring to the variable that refers to this function. So I can use this value, this reference, to do things. When I use the same name square with the parentheses, now I'm calling the function. So like the Square brackets means in trying to access an element of an array or a property of an object, 
the uh, normal parentheses are for calling a function. Of course, it, this only works if the, if the variable here refers actually to a function. But again, it's not a property of the name of the identifier square. It's a property of the value that happens to be the current value in that moment uh, for that variable. Um, okay, so, but this is just a simple definition. Uh, and then we have all the details. Uh, uh, the parameters may be zero, one, or more than one. We can assign a default value uh, to a function, uh, to, sorry, to a parameter. So uh, when I call a function, I can give to the function any number of parameters, any number of, of, uh, of current values, of actual values for the parameters. If the function defines four parameters and I, and I only give two, the remaining two will get the default value or undefined if there is no default value. So it's not a syntax error, not a runtime error. You just go on with undefined values. You can check inside the function whether that parameter was given or not. If you try to give more parameters than the function, then they will get lost. Um, parameter passing, the semantics of parameter passing is a by value of the reference. like uh, in the program of object for the, of object oriented programming in general so i get a copy of the reference to the object this means that i cannot modify the original variable the original reference but i can of course modify the value that is pointed to that so depending on where, what uh, value was referring before if it was an immutable value like string or a uh, or a number then I cannot modify that from inside the function. But if, if it was any other type of object that was passed to a function, then of course internally I can modify the object because the local parameter value becomes an alias from the variable that was passed as a parameter. So internally, when we, when we read that parameter passing is by value, let's not be fooled. We are not getting a copy of the object. We are getting a copy of the reference so the objects are still there, and we can still modify them. Hmm? Um, okay, here we have some example of lines of code for checking whether some parameter is missing. You can just compare with a defined or use uh, or set up a default value yourself. So you can use the normal mechanism for setting a default value if it's a constant. And the, but if you want to set a default value, maybe in a more complicated way, you, you, can, you can test it inside the function. Yes? No, you cannot. So, no, there is no way of limit the type or the names of the parameters. Yeah, whatever you receive, you have to, to go with it. So, uh, there, there's no. Yeah, no, you cannot specify the type of the parameter you accept. So maybe you imagine you receive a number, uh, you, you will receive a string or an array. And we will find a lot of functions that depending on the type they receive, they do different things, they, be, they behave in different ways. So this is a, is a sort of a feature, like a sort of a, a cheap polymorphism. So uh, instead of having the different version of the, of, the, of the same function with different signatures, we don't have a signature, we just have the function name. Um, if we think about it, uh, it's, uh, it cannot be any other way because a function is just a name. So the name itself or the syntax can, cannot bind in any way how it is being called. So only at the runtime we, we will discover what are the values that are actually being passed. We cannot do before the call. So only the function itself because Maybe tomorrow will not be called a square, we will call this B, C, D, or whatever, and, uh, and we'll work in the same way. So uh, that's the price we have to pay for, for maximum flexibility. There's no control over the parameters. Uh, there is a mechanism if you want to accept an, a variable number of parameters that, uh, again, is, uh, relies on the spread operators. 
say, okay, I need two parameters and all the other ones that please put them into an array. And so I will um, navigate the array myself. But I won't spend time here because I think it's a, it's a very corner case, you know, just to recognize it where you, where you, uh, where you see the syntax. Hmm? So this is the classic version. The second version is a so-called function expression. So uh, if we look at the, the second box here, 2A, we see that we have a, the syntax for creating a function, maybe with the name or maybe without the name. It doesn't do anything special. And all of this from the f function to the closing brace becomes an expression. Like it was a numerical expression. 3 plus 2 divided by 5. Instead, it's function, parameters, body. All this expression creates an object of type function and creates a reference to this object. And you can use uh, this reference to store it uh, maybe into a variable. So we are defining a new function inside an expression. If we just forgot, no, okay, there are different syntaxes here, okay? So in, in the first case, an anonymous function that has been created and stored into a variable. In the second case, this function also remembers a name, but we cannot use this name for calling the function. Because the name is stored inside the object, and this is not a name in your scope, in your list of variables. This is the name, fn, will be the name for calling the function. So it's even more explicit than before. We really see that we are creating an object, and we remember the reference to that object. The reference happens to be called fn, may be called anywhere else. Any other name may be stored into an object property, may be stored into an array element. Because it's just a, from F, the closing brace is just a value hmm? that behaves as a function. So this Fn, if I don't look at what happened after the equal sign, Fn may be anything, maybe a number, maybe a string, maybe a function, maybe an object. When we create an object, we see an opening brace here. Okay. I recognize from the syntax that it's uh, an opening brace. Instead of, of an opening brace here, we have the keyword function. That starts the definition of, the, of a literal function, a literal value for function. The two definitions are totally equivalent. So I have the same, a function called square is the same as before. And then I define the function called cube with the expression, with the function expression syntax. This is the value from the f of function to the closing brace. And that if you see on, on the stack, on the variables, after they, have the, they are defined, they behave in exactly the same, the same way. Uh, there's just a slight difference that you cannot redefine this value where it's just, it becomes a sort of a const. And in this case, cube was defined as let. I wouldn't recommend that, but in theory, you can redefine this cube to point to something else. I would prefer to define that as const, of course. But when I call the function cube, you see, let, let's just read the last line here and the last line there. They are identical. The, in, the way in which I am using a function defined in a classical way or defined in a with a function expression is exactly the same. Okay? Okay. They were crazy enough to have two different uh, uh, syntaxes. But the second one is much more flexible because uh, you can use it whenever you have an expression. So the function keyword uh, can only be used at the top level or inside the, 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 the body is inside as a new statement, let's say. An expression can be anywhere. So you can even create a function on the fly inside the parameter of, a, of, a, of another function. 
uh, I mentioned briefly before uh, that the sort method of an array may receive a, a comparison function as an argument. So what you would do, maybe remember Java, you had to create a class that uh, um, extends a comparator where uh, that is either a single method that will compare the values if you want to give a, uh, a custom uh, sorting order to the sort function of the Java collection. Here we just have to provide um, a function in the parameter list. Let's try to see it practically. Uh, it's the first step. Uh, uh, so let's try to imagine I want to sort the acronyms not by uh, name but by length. The shortest one, the longer one, the longer one, and so on. Okay? So I need to define in the sort uh, function. Uh, in the sort method must have a parameter of a function that compares two elements and returns a negative, uh, positive, or null value according to whether the first is before, equal, or, af or after, to be positioned before or, e or after the other. Okay, it's a normal comparison function. That takes two elements and returns a number. Um, so, usually we would have to define, let's do it afterwards, okay, resort it another time. We should define a function, a compare length, that receive two parameters A and B, and this function returns maybe the length of A minus the length of B. Okay? This is a classical, fu a classical function definition. It's a bit dangerous because we are using the length attribute of parameter A, but he was worried and I am a bit worried that A, we do, I don't know what it is. I hope it's a string. I'm not sure. There's no way to enforce that. We could check it, but there's no way to enforce it. And even if it were an array, it would work. So any type of object that has a length attribute and that returns a value that can be subtracted, okay, length, uh, Normally, length is an integer number, but if length is a property of my own object, uh, may return anything. Okay. So, but if we are passing good parameters to this function, this should work. And so, we can sort the acronyms with the comparison function, which is compare length. And then we can see whether the, the acronyms are sorted in length order. I never saw, I'm never so lucky when I write code for myself. Uh, so it works. Okay? What did we do? We created a function the name of the function is a reference to the function object. This reference is being just passed to a method sort that requires a function such and such with two parameters, with an integer result, so we did everything by the book. Notice that we, don't, we are not calling this function here. There are no braces here. It's not. Uh, compare length, uh, okay, of some parameters. No, I, I wouldn't know which parameters to put there. I don't, I don't have the parameter. I'm not, call, I'm not the one calling this function. The code of the sort function inside, inside its loops, is we will call this function with the parameters that it will choose. 
I'm just telling you, okay, whenever you need to call a function of such and such with two parameters, go there. The only thing I need is the reference to this function to be passed around. I can define that as a function. I can define that as a function expression. Uh, for example, uh, compare length equal to function and all the same. So let me copy that because I'm lazy. And let's comment that in order not to have two different identifiers, not to override identifiers. So this is an alternative way of defining the same function with a slightly different symbol. Okay, and of course the result, okay, const, the result, is the same. But in this case, the only way, the only place I'm using this value is here. It's unlikely that I need this short custom comparison function somewhere else. So in some way I'm wasting this identifier, these lines of code and so on. The only thing that the short function needs uh, to have is the reference to the function. So I can just take the function expression itself and paste it here. It starts to, be, to become uh, not ugly, but so we are calling a function and in the parameter list of the function, we have a constant. This constant is not seven, is function such and such. We are creating a constant value. I mean constant because it's, uh, as a, well, constant is not a real word, it's a literal. So uh, a piece of code that will create a value. Instead of a literal array or a literal object or a literal string, we are just writing a literal function using the function expression. So it's very common to have functions that are only needed in one place to be written exactly in that place instead of defining a function, choosing a name for that function, and uh, passing that name, and then remember not to call that function in anywhere else and so on. Just, okay, we find it, we use it there. That's why the function expression is more useful than the function declaration, which is the statement form. We don't need to know the name of this function. This function does not have a name. It's an inline anonymous function. Of course, we need to keep track of these uh, opening parentheses is closed there, which is closes the list of arguments of the method sort. A, B are the parentheses around the parameters of the new anonymous inline function. These braces are part uh, of the definition of the function. So it's a bit strange to see a brace inside the parentheses, but we'll see a lot of them. Okay. Again, this function is defined and is not called. The cut and paste that I did didn't change a bit in the interpretation of the function. Okay. And so I don't need this anymore. And the result is still the same. Of course, it, will, it might be harder to, to debug, probably, because this function doesn't have a name anymore. But in, uh, in functional programming, when we are really passing functions around, uh, in many, in many cases, just uh, the function is not only needed there. Everything I need is, right, is there. It becomes difficult to read, so let's try, try to keep very, no, 
know, tie the code and well aligned and so on because now I have one function to the parameter. I could have four of them, all in the parentheses of the of the of a method call. So uh, it can be, become messy quite quite quickly. Um, by the way, uh, right now what I did here is a way of using the value of a function as a parameter of another function. Okay, we will explain it better uh, on Monday. We call it the callbacks, mm -hmm. a function that will be called back by another function. If I define a function and uh, store it as a property of an object, normally you call it a method. Our point, uh, point dot compare, uh, would be uh, uh, a property of the object whose value is a function. Normally, we call it a method of the object, but it's just our understanding that it will be used as a method. Okay. So there are different names uh, for corresponding to the different usages of these functional expressions, but the nature is always the same. It's just an object with a reference. But since these functional expressions are very common, they invented a shorthand syntax, which is syntax number three, where we get rid of the keyword function. So we don't have the keyword function anymore. Uh, but instead of that, we have a new keyword, which is sort of an arrow. In fact, we call them the arrow function. Usually. It's a sort of a function expression because it creates a function. But instead of the function keyword that comes before, we have the arrow keyword that comes between the list of parameters and the body. Apart from that, it's the same. So it's a strange way of writing this function as a function compare length const compare length equal to a function that takes two parameters and returns this difference. So let's put the compare length again here. And check that it's correct. Okay. So this one, this third one, is identical to the second one. Nearly identical. There is some slightly different behavior in arrow function than function expression. But it's a form of a function expression. It's more difficult to, to see that it's a function because we don't have the function keyword. Uh, so we must train our eyes into the arrow symbol. There's an arrow, that's a function. If on the left of the arrow, we have the parameters. On the right of the arrow, we have the body. The arrow is binding more strongly than the equal. Okay, so this is a single expression that is assigned to the length hmm, as an operator. Uh, inside these braces, you can do anything. Okay, it can be one line, can be two two hundred lines. In many cases, the body. Of a, of a functional expression, especially if it's a narrow function, would be very simple, like in this case, where we compute a value and we return immediately that value. So there is an even shorthanded uh, format where if the only operation we need to do is to compute a value and return that value, and we can do that in one line, we can drop the braces and can drop the return keyword. This leaves us with uh, with 
with them. Oh, it's a special case. When the body is so small that it just contains one single return statement, you can drop the return and you can drop the braces. So the right hand of the arrow operator may be a full body or may be just an expression. In this case, the expression will be the return value of the function. And it will still be a function, okay? We are just sim simplifying the way in which we are writing them. All the four forms of, so three have been commented, or four, four have been commented, this is the fifth one. They behave in exactly the same way. Well, not really exactly. The difference only, the only difference way is how they handle the keyword this in the JavaScript language that we see, we will see much later. But for the moment, they are act, syn, uh, different syntax variations around the same concept. There's even a further simplification when we have only one parameter, so instead of A, B, only maybe A, like, uh, uh, I don't know if it's in the example. Yeah, the square function, where we only have one parameter, so we, usually we have the parameter list in parentheses, arrow the body, in this case, the body contains only a return of an expression, so we can drop the return and drop the, the braces. And the parameter list contains only one parameter, and so we can draw the parentheses. The only surviving thing is the arrow. Hmm? So this is a special case. When, when you have more than one parameter, you must have the parentheses, of course. If by chance you have only one parameter, it can be omitted. And of course, our final uh, version will be just to take this format of the function and just put it online. Because it's an expression, so I can put the expression directly into the parameter list. And it's always the same. It takes a bit to, to get used to the syntax, but what happens, I think it's, it's clear, it's simple. It all comes from the initial assertion that functions are objects. And so objects live somewhere, and they have a reference variable that gives me, that points to that object. And so I can play with these references as, as I like. Hmm? And these objects can be created with an expression syntax and not with a statement syntax. And this multiplies the number of places where this expression can be, can be written. Okay, so at first sight, uh, this expression could look strange, but if we are, after we built it you know, step by step, uh, I think it's, uh, it's just a matter of uh, you know, training our eyes in, uh, in uh, seeing and parsing that. Of course, if the body of this function would be a long uh, list of statements, uh, I would suggest against this syntax. No? But, uh, and so I would prefer to define the function elsewhere and so on. But as, as we will see, there it will be, from, from due to the fact that functions are so, are so easy to pass around, a lot of time we will have to create functions that will be used only once especially as callbacks. And so we will be strongly pushed towards uh, this kind of, uh, of inline definition. Uh, okay. Arrow function may have zero, one, or more parameters. So it's, so it's even possible to define an arrow function with no parameters. We just put the, the parentheses. We must put them, otherwise the syntax would not hold. But it's possible to have no parameters. Uh, the return value, if you have the, 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 bo the body of the function, it should have a return value, uh, sorry, a return uh, um, statement, 
otherwise the value will be undefined. Uh, in an implicit form, uh, the return is not uh, needed, so the, 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 value, the return value would be directly the expression. So uh, it's not a surprise that uh, I can define a function anywhere because it's just an expression. And so if I have a function, inside that function, I can define a nested function. So you see the definition of function hypotenuse. And uh, inside that, uh, maybe useful to have a function called square. I define it like here. I can define it as a narrow function or as a function statement, even. Or a function of expression, as, you, as I like. No, the, the different forms are equivalent. And it, they all do the same. They create an object and give me a reference to that object. So if I only need to call this function from inside this external function, I can define my helper function here and just use it. The inner function cannot be called or seen from the outside of the function unless I decided to return or to store this square value somewhere else. So I want to push it out, I can. But, uh, and I will see that. They are called closing. But syntactically, the name square is scoped within this function, so it cannot be called from anywhere else. It's protected, yes? With? With uh, var, no, var is scoped at the function level. So inside the function, but not outside the function. Um, because it's not just a block, any block, it's a function block, okay? So it delimits the, the, the scope of a var. Um, and, but the inner function can access the values of the variable visible inside the function itself. So in this case, it doesn't, it's a pure function. This is a pure function because uh, it, uh, its value, its body, depends only on its parameters, okay? But uh, I could define a function that would uh, use, read, or modify the parameters of the external function or some local variables in the external function. So the body of this function can see the context, the scope in which it is defined. See all the resolved the variables in the scope in which it's defined. And of course, in addition to its own parameters. And that would be important in a moment. It would be important because it creates a mechanism called the closure. This is the definition. I don't think it's understandable. A closure is a, is a name given to a feature in the language, okay, by which a nested function executed after the execution of the outer function can still access the outer function scope. So how can a function, a nested function, okay, this is easy, a function defined inside another one, executed after the execution of the outer function. How can I do that? So if, if this function square can only be seen from inside this function and not be called from outside, it's, it may only be called while this function is active. It cannot be called after this function has finished processing. Well, in JavaScript, there's no problem in return, wait, in returning this value from the function. And so this value would survive, survive after the end of the function and we may be used to call the square function from outside the, the outer function where it was defined. So it's strange. Okay, I'm defining something like it seems private and then I'm exporting this name. The function that created dies but I can still call the internal function. If it's a pure function, 
who cares? It's just a function. It depends on its parameters. But the interesting part when, comes when this function is not pure, but it will access some local values in the external function. A local variable here normally is destroyed when the function ends. But if I have a closure, so an internal function that will access that local variable, well, that local variable is kept alive because there is still a reference to it. Think of Gabriel collection, okay? Why does do a local variable is destroyed when the function closes? Because there's no way to access it anymore. Because square will not will be destroyed too. But if square survives in some way because I exported the name, I saved it, I returned it, then square will be an object. And inside that object, there will be a reference to a variable, to a value, basically. So I, for as long as the function is alive, the object that was a local variable cannot be destroyed. So a local variable of a function may survive after the end of the function if it's being accessed by an inner function that was referencing it. This is the mechanism of the closure. This function that in some way I, I, I'm calling after my creator has died is able to keep alive the local variables of the creator, the values basically. So I can still access the scope of the outer function, so the, the values defined inside the outer function, the scope, after that outer function has died. And uh, um, this is an idea of an application of a, of a closure. We have a function that inside defines a function, a nested function. And look at here, return hello. The return value of this function is a function. So this function is a sort of creator for other functions. And this other function will be this one and will uh, mix uh, a string and a name. This name is not a parameter of the function. So it's not a function where I pass the name and it will say hello to that name. It's a function that will say hello to a very specific name that was, by, by the way, a parameter of the external function, created by a parameter of the external function. So what this external function does is to return me a function uh, to get a, a name and return me a function that is able to say hello to that specific name. If I call this greater function with two different names, it will return me two different functions. The first one that is will say hello Tom and the second one that will say hello Jerry. So I call hello Tom, it will write hello Tom. But the function is this one. These two, what, what do these two functions have in common and what is different between the two? Hello Tom and hello Jerry. These are just two references to, this, to two function objects. The code is the same. There are two function objects whose code is identical character by character, but they are closing, closing, they have closures over different variables. The first one, what is a closure? It's a reference to a variable which is not mine. 
but it's taken from the context. So in the first function, hello Tom has this code that will close over this local variable that was created when calling the first time the greeter function. Then I call the greeter function a second time. Okay, it will be a, sec a new context, a new variable here. And uh, this, L, this new hello function will have a closure over this new variable. So in a way, it remembers a snapshot of the value of that variable when the function was created. Okay, so every time we define a function that will access the external scope, if this function is the reference to this function is retained and used somewhere else, then we will also retain all the containing scope. And this can be used, okay, this was just a warning, we are returning the reference to the function, just remember not to call the function itself, okay? Because otherwise it will be a string. If we call the function, it will execute and return a string, and this alloton will be a string, and of course it cannot call a string. Um, okay, this just explained that. And we can use this mechanism, for example, to emulate in a way the behavior of objects with methods. We will see better way of doing that, uh, and of course we'll do exercises on that, but the concept is here. Uh, we have a function that defines uh, or creates uh, a counter object. Huh? Uh, this function returns a, uh, sorry, yeah, this function returns a function, get next. And this function, basically what it does is to close over a value, which is initialized to zero. There's a closure of this value, you see, that can be incremented every time. So when I call the counter function, it will create this get next function, closing over a new value, a new variable, initialized to zero. And we return this function. This value, which is the state of the counter, is zero. It can only be accessed by this body, and basically the, by the color of this function that has still, the, has still the reference to this function. And so you see that I initialize a counter there, and it returns me count one, which is a function. If I call this function, Every time I call this function, that function will increase the value and return the new value. And it will still remember the value that has been increased. It's being attached to this function. It's not the same as defining the value inside here, okay? If, if this letter were here inside this function, it would be reinitialized to zero every time I call it. Because the scope of this function is recreated every time I call the function. It belongs to a scope that is long dead, but is still alive. It's a zombie. And so it's the same variable, it's not being recreated. I cannot emulate that with a single function. I need this function to have access to some permanent information outside the function itself. And such a function means inside the enclosing function. And if every time I call counter, I will get a different counter. Because every time I call counter, I, would, I will recreate and initialize to zero new value and create a new incremental function customized to close over that specific value. And we can generalize this mechanism if uh, this one can only increment. And what if we want to do something more than just increment? It might be a counter, I want to reset it and to increment it. So I cannot return just a one function. I need to return more than one function. Okay, who cares? Let's return an object with many properties that are all the functions that we need. So we have this, this counter value, n equal to zero, 
and we want to have a function for increasing the count and a function for resetting the counter. The return can only return one value, and so we pack the two functions into one object. Yes? No, there is no way that we can create objects with private values. But n is private. Uh, we are creating an object that has two properties, okay, which are functions. The value n is not a property of this object. It's, pr it's, pr it's protected in this way, okay? It's hidden. Because the only thing I have from the return statement is an object with two, let's call them methods, properties of type function. N is not visible from this object. I can only manipulate N by calling this function. So actually, N is not a property of this object that would be visible to everybody. It's a closure of the functions inside this object. But I cannot manipulate those. Okay, so these two functions, count and reset, that are of course defined as a functional, with a functional expression, they are both closing over the same single variable. So this n here, this n here, and this n there are the same n, the same object being pointed to. Hmm? Because it's been created inside the same context. Okay, and so what I, what can I do? I create a new counter, two different counters, C and D. I can increment C or D separately, I can reset C, I can increase C and so on. So in this way, we are sort of creating an object. I can say with private property, but with has access to private values. And these private values can be manipulated only by a set of functions that I define. So this is the simplest usage of closures. Uh, there is even, I am skipping this one, a special syntax uh, for this kind of objects that are called construction functions or, or constructor functions. I mentioned them before the break briefly. And this is our end point for today. Um, when I can define, when I, I'm creating, I, when I want to create something like this, okay, an object with set of properties and a set of methods, I can use a function, constructor function, well, it's a normal, it's a special kind of function that by convention we have a capital letter, instead normally the function should be all lowercase, and it's called with the new keyword. When I, using the new keyword in calling a function, this function has a, a new special reference that is called this. So basically what happens is that uh, uh, the new operator will create a new empty object. The function will populate this object with some values or functions. And will return, there's no return statement here. It will return the, this object that has just been created. So it's a short-term notation for create an object populated with, the, uh, with some properties and methods and return me this object. And from the caller, it looks like, you know, it looks like a class instantiation, right? New, but it's not a class, it's a function. Because the, fun the mechanism of functions are enough for giving, us the, uh, for giving us the same functionality that in other languages classes have. By the way, my car is a normal JavaScript object. So you can mangle with its properties, add properties. But if, once it's created, it's a normal object. There's no protection or nothing that will bind it to this set of, uh, but it's something for discipline, for this uh, of men. Okay, so thank you for today. And uh, we'll try to make it more complex uh, next uh, Tuesday. <laughs>